everybody to the town board of the town of Austin work session for November 6th, 2019. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we had a fifth Tuesday last week, and with Election Day yesterday, uh, we are feeling a little off schedule, but tonight we have a number of interesting topics to discuss in our work session. Before we get into that, I just want to acknowledge all of the community who came out to vote in this year's election, whether via our newly inaugurated early voting process or to your regular polling places yesterday. In this off-year off election with no celebrity seats at the top, uh, we were happy to see that we got a pretty good turnout because it's not usually a, a great uh, time to get people motivated to vote. But this year, it seems like we did get a, out a, a little over 4,000 voters to the polls. And we're still waiting for clarification about the early voting totals. Uh, but in coming years, we anticipate that making it easier for people to vote at their convenience will result in higher totals. So we're grateful to the state legislature for, and the governor for uh, passing and signing that into law this year um, and trying to get us all on track for next year's presidential election. I would like to thank the community for your support for another two years uh, of, for me in office for, as town supervisor. Um, I was disappointed that the resolutions that we put forth to the community to save money and modernize offices and offer a better customer experience did not pass, especially as we continue to look under every rock to reduce taxes for you. Um, because this was a ballot initiative, the board and I had to be careful how we communicated with the public on these issues. Nevertheless, the misinformation campaign and tactics used to disadvantage our community were so disappointing, and in the end, in my opinion, will work against the best interests uh, of the taxpayers of Osney. However, I can assure you we will continue to work hard to find ways to save money in areas we, where we are not hamstrung by laws that were put into place hundreds of years ago. I'm very much looking forward to partnering with our residents and the board, and congratulations to my colleagues, Councilwoman Liz Feldman and Councilman Greg Meyer, who's not here quite yet, but I'm confident he'll be joining us, to continue to make our Austin an even more wonderful place to live, work, play, and enjoy. Councilwoman Feldman, did you want to say anything to the public? Yes, I wanted to thank everybody um, very much for their confidence and their support. Um, I am honored to serve another four-year term as councilwoman, and I would just like to thank everybody and just know I will be working very hard for you. As you always do. Um, okay, so now for a few highlights of upcoming events around our community. The Rotary Club of Austin is hosting its annual scholarship fundraiser this Friday, November 8th, uh, which usually used to always be the night before Election Day, um, but they changed things around this year. So it's going to be November 8th at the Austin Public Library starting at 6 p.m. And instead of their usual Employee of the Year recognition ceremony, they have planned what is sure to be a compelling inspirational talk by Jean-Paul Gonzalez. There will be a silent auction, music, 50-50 raffle, wine and hors d'oeuvres, all to support scholarships for Austin High School students. This weekend, November 8th, 9th, and 10th, um, there will be performances at 7 p.m. at Bethany Arts Community um, when Theater O presents And a Child Shall Lead by Michael Slade, featuring middle school actors. This is a heroic and true story of children coming of age in Terezin, the Jewish city established by the Nazis near Prague as a way station before the death camps. In the face of unspeakable horror, these children use their determination and creativity to build lives filled with hope and beauty, playing, studying, making art, and writing an underground newspaper, all at the peril of being executed. Their actual poems and stories are woven into a fast-paced drama evoking the universality of children caught in the insanity of war, appropriate for children ages 9 and up. Please be mindful of the subject matter before having young children attend the performance. Um, as mentioned, it's for most appropriate for ages nine and up, but you know your children best. It's sure to be a compelling performance. Ticks are available at Theater O's website, theaterO.org, for $10 each. Also this weekend, November 9th and 10th, is the Hudson River Potters Pottery Show and Sale at Bethany Arts Community from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
featuring our very own Cedar Lane Art Center, Keith Gordon. So be sure to check that out. Our state legislators, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef and Senator David Carlucci, have two community events scheduled in November. Starting with Assemblywoman Galef's community conversation on climate change at Cortland Town Hall next Wednesday, November 13th, from 7 to 9 p.m., then Senator Carlucci and Assemblywoman Galef are co-hosting the annual Austin Senior Fair on Thursday, November 19th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. This is always such an informative event for our community seniors, and we have a number of our departments who will be there, so I strongly encourage you to attend. And now into our, unless, does anybody have any other announcements? I have one. Okay. Um, Project Greenway is doing their fashion show this year at Scarborough Presbyterian Church on November 10th at 4 o'clock, and all proceeds go to the IFCA mm -hmm. thrift store. Fantastic. And it's always exciting because they upcycle a um, variety of clothing and use it to do a fashion show. And um, they, All ages. It's not, yeah, and it's not always just fabric. It's sometimes very interesting, interesting things. Yeah. Bottle caps that turn into a fancy gown or, or uh, those little tabs or whatever, you know. So mm -hmm. it's very cool. I, in the past, they've had very interesting designs coming, coming out of that. Um, and it's a fantastic event. So definitely plan to go. Um, okay, so anybody, anything else? That's it, right? I, I think the Austin awesome Arts Council has a um, exhibit, uh, Day of the Dead, from 3 to 5. Um, yes, they do. Um, on Sunday. Sunday, okay. And that's um, at the uh, steamer? At the steamer, steamer firehouse. firehouse. Um, um, that promises to be pretty amazing, so. It sure does. All right, fantastic. So tonight we are starting with a proposal from Eric Garrity of Sing Sing Co Brewery to curate craft beverages for the 2020 Summer Concert Series. This past summer, we worked closely with the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce and Mike and Miriam Risco of Risco Music to coordinate food trucks, beverages, and performances with great success. And also Sing Sing Co Brewery introduced um, their craft brews for the first time um, at the concert series. So we're excited to hear your proposal to discuss how we can possibly make this Austin favorite even bigger and better this year. Or next year, I should say, 2020. So if you want to come on up, that'd be great. Uh, are we having a little, we have a little PowerPoint, I think. So yeah. maybe you could scoot yeah. over and take a look and the light. Oh, which light is it? One of the two button ones. One of the little, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfection. Okay. All right, and how do we operate this? Now the mouse, you just click forward. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, Supervisor Levenberg and members of the Town Council for inviting us tonight to speak about our proposal to curate the uh, Craft Beverage Corral at the 2020 Waterfront Concert Series. Just to give you a brief history of our experience with the Waterfront Concert Series, we opened our door in, 20, in the summer of 2018. Uh, and we learned uh, a hard lesson that Westchester empties out in the summertime. And it was a struggle to maintain for our first summer. Uh, Austin is not yet a uh, summer vacation destination, so the population population density was quite diminished and uh the that, that's awesome uh so we had the weekends and that was what was covering us um and then all of a sudden we saw a drop off in fridays and then we yet again learned that the summer concert series was drawing a limited customer base down to the river and for good reason because on beautiful days, you have the sunset over the Palisades, uh, free music. People would rather hang out and drink down in the park than come inside. Uh, so we spoke with Supervisor Levenberg after the series concluded and discussed participating in the 2019 Summer Concert Series. So uh, we were able to do so and uh, uh, it was a great success. Um, rather than having to compete with the series and try to draw customers back inside, partnering with the Waterfront Concert Series, participating in it was a great way to uh, create a mutual benefit between the town of Austin and Sing Sing Kill Brewery to elevate the series 
and uh, you know increase our revenue during a slow time. So here we are now after the 2019 concert series, looking to further elevate uh, the series as much as we are capable. So um, obviously we're here tonight to formally request partnering with the town of Austin to curate the Craft Beverage Corral at the 2020 Waterfront Concert Series at Lewis Engel Park. As, local, uh, as a local business in the town of Austin specializing in the manufacturing and retailing of New York farm beer, uh, Sing Sing Kilbury is uniquely poised to elevate the status of the series. Our knowledge and experience of both participating and hosting events combined with uh, our relationships that we fostered in the craft beverage community will increase the scope of vendor participation as well as customer engagement. Our regular coordination with the New York State Liquor Authority will ensure event compliance throughout the season. And uh, now I'd like to take the opportunity to turn it over to Kelly Cassidy who a lot of you know is our events coordinator at Sing Sing Kilbury, and she will run you through the details of our proposal. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Supervisor and Council members, for having us propose our proposal to you guys tonight. Um, what we have in mind for the 2020 Waterfront Concert Series is to utilize the Craft Beverage Corral as an opportunity to showcase local Hudson Valley breweries, cideries, and wineries. Um, each week we would feature at least one other craft beverage producer on a rotating basis. And also we would like to invite New York distilleries, thank you Eric, <laughs> New York distilleries uh, to join us and be a part of the series. And they would be able to offer free tastings to the public. Um, as the Craft Beverage Corral sponsor, we would have a consistent presence at the 2020 Waterfront Concert Series every Friday. And what we have in mind for the, the series and what we hope for is a heightened experience for the consumer. Um, so it doesn't have to be just about getting a craft beer or wine or cider or spirits. It's uh, with local producers, it's a chance to buy local, drink local and meet the makers. So it's more about engagement and the feeling of community. So what would this partnership look like? Um, we based our proposal off of the 2019 partnership packages, and we felt that the top tier would be most appropriate for what we are looking to do. So um, in exchange for a $2,500 sponsorship, we would be granted exclusive rights to curate all alcohol sales at the summer concert series, including the fireworks. And the partnership benefits would include um, the exclusive management and curation of the Craft Beverage Corral, Sing Sing Kill Brewery's logo displayed on all digital advertising with a direct link to our social media, logo on all banners, including the main stage display, the logo on all promotional and marketing materials, acknowledgement in all press releases, email blasts, and event programs, as well as the announcement of Sing Sing Kill Brewery as Craft Beverage Corral sponsor at each concert. So we're hoping to draw on the success of the 2019 concert series um, in a similar way that uh, Mike Risco Music School curated the uh, stage performances. We believe that our expertise will yield a uh, improvement in the craft beverage portion of the concert series. Uh, we hope that we can help to elevate the event uh, and generate more of a draw and put Austin on the map as a destination for the betterment of the entire business community. Uh, okay, so this seems really interesting um, and very positive. Uh, I think, I, I don't, I, certainly we're not going to make any decisions tonight, but we did want to, I know, have some questions. Um, I think for, um, I, I, one of the things that I was 
thinking originally when you talked a little bit about it is that these other um, breweries or vend or whatever uh, that they would also have. When you say presence, I'm not sure I exactly understand what it means. Are they only going to be like have a marketing presence? So the other vendors would only be able to sell, give tastes and sell like packaged products that couldn't be consumed on site? Or would they also be able to vend their products? They would be vending as well. Okay, so you're not vending their products. Well, what, what we would likely do, and this is something that we can... Uh, discuss in further detail, but there are, are a couple options. Probably the simplest of all options, because I know that in order to get a temporary permit, you have to present each week in front of the board and go through the process. As um, a brewery, we are able to purchase wholesale their product from them and have them come and be present and pour, but we would purchase their product. And that way we wouldn't have to go through a process weekly and we would have the, a greater ability to, um, you know, access breweries, cideries, and wineries that don't necessarily, uh, you know, have a great experience going through the process with the SLA or be able to change, you know, quickly if, if there's an issue and someone's not able to make it that week. So there'd be the maximum flexibility if we were to do it that way. So that's likely the direction we would head. Would the vendors be able to use their signage or any of their... Yeah, so they would be present. Like the whole idea is that they would be, it would be meet that maker kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we would be promoting them. We would be, you know, part of, part of, in order to be present, they need to send representation and they need to be, you know, actively involved and in pouring their beer. And that's consistent with the way that a lot of the festivals that we participate in operate. So, um, whenever we go, uh, you know, we, I think the most recent one was hops on the Hudson and a lot of these places like, um, Cap Lawrence with their sour in September and, and all this stuff, they, there's a requirement that some representation of the brewery and it's not just, just a hired hand. So they'd um, be using your liquor license or they'd have that. Yeah. Own so we, permit. we would have the permit. I mean, they have liquor license, but Sing Sing Kill Brewery would hold the temporary permit and purchase the alcohol from them. And then they would be just the be dispensing it. it, right? But it would it would come through us. So normally, for every entity that comes, food truck, business, whatever, they pay a fee to be represented there. Would they be paying the chamber a fee like everybody else? No. If if we were to curate the craft beverage corral. The, the $2,500 sponsorship is what we would pay the town to do so. And then we would buy the beer from that vendor to have them come and participate. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think that's something I, I want to process. I think that, you know, we, we just need to do a little analysis of that, how that would break down. So, I mean, just theoretically, I think last year vendors were paying, I think it was like two fifty for fireworks now at the fireworks would you have other vendors or something but i'm just trying to that's the idea yeah yeah at the fireworks as well yeah. okay um and then it was like 175 for and then there was like 50 dollars discount if you did the whole you know if you did i think more than one or if you did the whole series there was some something like that um so i think that um it seemed like if it were just you guys you know that's the 2500 is more than enough i think that just trying to figure out, it, it would have been like another, we're, I'm just trying to figure out what the offset would be. In other words, if each of these vendors were to come and pay separately. What would that look like? What would that look like? And are they, when you say you're purchasing the beer, are you purchasing it at like a wholesale price? Or are you purchasing it at what the equivalent of the retail would be if they were to sell that whole keg or whatever? Let's just, I'm just going to say like. Well, that would, that would be a negotiation. Okay. between us and the breweries, cideries, wineries, you know, whatever, you know, we, we determine basically the value of having people here. Sometimes it's wholesale, sometimes it's more, uh, and sometimes it's, it's, you know, just a purchase of, of a certain amount of product, whether they serve it or not situation. So, okay. I think but we, but we would not be charging the other manufacturers we would be purchasing their product got it okay did you have a question 
regarding this? No. Okay. Um, did you have another question? A follow up question? Um, so I'm, I'm, I just. Yeah, I'm just trying to process. I mean, it the seems whole, to me like, like. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure that, you know, each vendor that is there, that is represented there, is contributing to the cost of the overall concert series and benefiting the, you know, chamber and work, or at least the concert series um, the way everybody else is. I want to make sure it's equal on all set fronts. I don't want. Or if they're not contributing, you're contributing the equivalent of what, of what they would have. Or. Right. right. So that, that, that was the should. idea behind the right. $2,500. Right. right. So we're going to have to look at the logistics of that i just think i, I just think i want to if you could include maybe um an understanding for us of how many is that you know how many how that breaks down in, in relation to what we're charging right now what, what you know because remember that the right now the agreement that we have with the chamber is that we're there's a, a an agreement in place that we're benefiting from the vendors the town is to offset the cost of the concert series so that we can basically improve the concert series without impact to the tax payers, right? So we, we you know, we want, we understand that this has a, an overall benefit. We want to, you know, bring, we want to make it better every year, um, but we don't necessarily want to increase the cost to the taxpayers. So we're trying to, you know, this is like a public private partnership as it were um, to a certain extent so that we're ending up being able to put that money back into the series and continue to have this overall bringing people to the, you know, the waterfront in Austin. And I think there's, there's two points. Um, I, I really like the idea, yeah. but, um, also, um, you know, number one, the fact that, um, Sing Sing Kill is making these connections, like these are vendors that may not otherwise have come to us. So that's yes, number absolutely. one. Um, and number two, I think there's nine concert dates this year, including the fireworks. So at 175 a clip, that's only about $1,500. So already we're coming out, you know, ahead in, in that regard. Well, depending on how many vendors it seems are how, depending on how many vendors. Well, right? it sounded like you would be, I mean, unless I misunderstood that it would be Sing Sing and an additional vendor each week. Right. Yeah. At, at a minimum, possibly two. like, you know, not to oversaturate it. Yeah, but, but it's not going to be like yeah. five, you know, at, at a clip. It would be in addition to things like maybe. One and there's two. also the issue of weather, you know, any, any given day could be a bust. So, you know, we have to consider that as well. Right. So right. $250. Are we, is that what's our normal? No, it's $250 for the fireworks. For the fireworks. The fireworks. It was $175, and then... uh, I think, for each. For each food truck, it was one seventy five for each of the rest of the concerts, um, and then I think if there were if they came multiple times or they committed to more, then there was some kind of a fifty dollar reduction or some such total. Okay, so he's already over the. So we'll, I think, we'll look I think at the, we, we need to look need at to the... process the numbers and how it works out and have an understanding of how many vendors we're talking about. And again, I think that overall, I mean, this is something that we're all interested in looking at which is to make it easier not harder to have these events to have vendors come and to have some sort of a, a share of the benefit for everybody so that we all benefit right again we're not making money we're offsetting costs to produce the concert series to make sure you know maybe we bring in better bands maybe we bring you know or we have a one day that could be you know a festival that you know there's we're kind of looking also to expand the event, we'll just call it the event, even though it's multiple events, um, so that, it, you know, again, we give the most benefit to the community and also to visitors so that they can see what we have to offer. And again, you know, I mean, you guys, you know, with Big Oss, it was great. You guys really promoted the um, the community, all the, you know, the, the business in the community, and that was so nice, which is great. I think, you know, again, I think we saw with the concert series, that any of our local vendors ended up getting business from, and I hope you guys did too, like where people came back, returned, not just for the concert series, but maybe came and stopped by because they knew that you guys had been, you know, a great product and they wanted to, to come and try it again, right? Because that's the, uh, you know, that's the un obvious, that's a, a, the upside to not only having, pulling everybody out of their regular spaces, but, um, you know, also driving people back to those spaces when we're not having the concerts take that business away from your your brick and mortar establishment and introducing them to other venues and vendors right. from you know from their industry would is great too 
So yeah, I mean, I think that just makes it more fun. I mean, Hudson Valley a better destination. One of the things you know we know is we and we we actively thought about this last year and, and with guidance from the chamber, we were very dead set on keeping it called. You know, keep, we we're going to keep calling this the summer concert series, the waterfront concert series, and they wanted to call it Food Truck Fridays. Well, guess what? As much as we love concerts and, and everything, which we still kept our concert series, people like the food trucks. People come for the food trucks. They stay for the concert, but they don't come for the concert and then get the food. That's kind of what we learned, I think, the year before, um, where we tried to do that. So this year, they, you know, again, I think that this is an added value, um, in my opinion, mm-hmm. to have different breweries because people are always looking for tasting you know, taste of Hudson Valley or whatever you can get. So I think it's, um, you know, it's really exciting that we can um, have the opportunity to get different um, breweries down here. And you guys already feature, I think, other breweries and other distilleries and stuff like that, which is great. Um, so I think it's just a matter of like us understanding how the numbers, where we net out. Um, and, and also, I think to a certain extent, just like, you know, who, how is it going to run? Because right now, one of the things that we were trying to also do, uh, partnering with the chamber and with the Riscos, was kind of get it out of our office. <laughs> like, we didn't want to spend a lot of time managing the concert series week, week in and week out. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Um, we're still working on that, but it, it did get better, um, certainly, to a certain extent. I mean, last year was the first year with the food trucks uh, at this level. I mean, we had food trucks before, but, you know, not as many. So, you know, I think that we just have to have an understanding of how it's all going to run and who's in charge and that sort of thing. And right now I feel like, you know, that the chamber is still going to be our go-to, like sort of there, they get down there at four o'clock or whatever time to make sure that, you know, they're receiving everybody. So we're just going to want to make sure that there's like a point person that is clear who that is. And, uh, and that pretty much just want to make sure that everybody's, you know, on the same page in terms of we're all following the same rules. And this is one of the things that we're challenged with, which is that we're not necessarily even following our own best rules yet as we expand our all of our events, you know, not just this event, but other events. Um, and I know the village is also tackling these issues. So we want to make sure that at, to the best extent possible, we can have a set, our set, of set set of rules so that we aren't breaking our own rules and we're making it easier for these events to happen in a way that's positive for everybody that's involved. So with that, with that said, I think that, um, I mean, I think that we just like to crunch the numbers yep. a little bit. And then I have one um, more question. Um, the liability, will they give you another waiver? I mean, I don't necessarily feel like if they're serving, it's not just you serving, it's them serving too. I don't know that Sing Sing Kill Brewery should be the only liable party, God forbid. Well, we, I mean, will they be giving you a, a brewery insurance? Brewery insurance covers events. Okay. So we. So you'll have a rider covering Sing Sing Kill. If right. So so we we get a um, a certificate of insurance naming the the venue, which would be uh, Lewis Engel Park Waterfront Concert Series, uh, and the town of Ossing as additional insured. Any other brewery, winery, distillery, cidery would also be required to do the same. Okay, thank you. That's important. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can also consult our own insurance company to see what, what he'd recommend for this sort of arrangement. Well, I mean, obviously, we yeah. want to protect the town, but I also don't right. think it's fair to have one. Right. To have our guy responsible for whoever does serves whoever. So. Oh, I see. Our guy. By our guy, you're seeing these yeah. guys. If okay. they're going to be curating it. Yeah. You know, like, you know, right. the but, but, can't be responsible right. for what the bands do. They can't be responsible for when. No, everybody's right. And that's the same. Just for the, for the bands, the bands are all required also to provide insurance and the food trucks. So, you know, there's a lot of insurance. A lot of insurance provisions. Um, how, how do you let you guys know? <laughs> <laughs> and I do think, okay. and I so, think but, you guys have done this, but I do think that we tried last year to include in the application for the food trucks that we wanted, um, you know, uh, environmentally friendly cups and all of that. Yeah, er- everything we do is compostable. You do, but how about all these other? Well, we we could do that. I mean, if if that, if, right. if it's if there is a commitment to a zero waste event like we did for the Big Ass Barbecue, yeah. then we would certainly make that uh, you know a determining factor in the other vendors that we 
to choose from. Yeah. I, I'm committed to it. Again, hopefully it doesn't preclude us from too many and people are getting on the bandwagon. <laughs> As it were. Uh, uh, concert concert series. series. Exactly. Pun intended. Actually, pun was intended. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank great. you. This is a great proposal. really a great proposal. And uh, I think, you know, we're just going to, again, just crunch the numbers and see if we can all come up to uh, something amicable and uh, work together again with the chamber and the RISCOs, because I think that we were all pretty excited that that went very well last year. And if we can make it better and everybody can work in harmony, then uh, we'll be good to go. All right. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Okay, all right, so next up, where are we on? And next up, we have two, department, two departmental reports this evening. And first up, we are going to hear from Kathy Asaro from our Senior Nutrition Program. Hi, Kathy. Welcome. Thank you. It's a little past your bedtime, we know, but. Not yet. Well, okay, we no, get up, so. you have to get up early in the morning <laughs> for our seniors. Oh, yeah, 8 o'clock on there yep. every morning. Uh, just wanted to let you know that the primary function of the senior center is to feed them a hot meal every day um, to our seniors Monday through Friday. We serve about 50 seniors in the dining room per day and 25 people we deliver home deliver meals to. So... Um, we have ongoing events every day. We have Monday. Monday we have um, Monday and Friday's bingo, which is their favorite. Tuesday we have chair yoga. Wednesday we take um, after lunch the seniors shopping, food shopping to shop right. Um, Thursday we have um, dance at 10:45. Uh, Friday we have an exercise class at 9:45. Um, we also have Steve, the pharmacist from, um, Prescription Center, comes every Tuesday, every last Tuesday of the month to do blood pressure. He's pretty good. They like him. They wait for him to come. We have an Are You OK program. Um, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock calls to our seniors that are alone. I call every morning, Saturday, Sunday, Monday through Friday, every day. Um, we also have a taxi coupon program, uh, which helps the seniors get around town, those that don't drive 70 and over, um, to their local appointments, hairdresser, food store, wherever they want to go. Um, we have speakers come in occasionally to tell the seniors, you know, updates, uh, Medicare. For instance, today we had somebody from Atria came to do uh, community outreach about local housing um, options. Uh, last week we had a speaker from Hudson Valley Hospital Center which who talked about managing their prescriptions. Um, we also had um, County Legislator Catherine Borgia come last week and she did a um, senior forum and some of the topics they uh, talked about were preventing scams and seniors and the census, which is important, um, along with a couple other presentations they did. Um, we also have ongoing information and assistance every day at the center, if you need any assistance with anything. Senior, we do it. Uh, we had a Halloween party last week with about 85 seniors. Did they all dress up? Uh, a couple of them did. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the staff dressed up, but uh, one of the seniors dressed up. She had a something over her head, and she was walking around with a with a broom, just dancing. <laughs> we had, United Healthcare provided the DJ for free, so oh, nice. went along. They just wanted to talk to the seniors, so they gave a 10-minute presentation and just. They had fun. Um, November 19th that you just said they're having a senior forum, Senator Carlucci and Assemblywoman Sandy Galef down at the community center from 10 to 2. If you want to, they're having over 50 local vendors um, and resources. How can you see you want to zoom in?
just in case anybody's interested. Got it? Okay. And also December 6th, uh, 1115, a speaker from the county will be discussing older driver, older driver safety. Exactly. To to for, for those seniors that are still driving. We have some seniors Older that are driver safety. <laughs> including my mom who's almost 90 and still driving. Yep. They talk to you about oh. reflexes and all everything. Don't yep. realize change over exactly. the years, uh, whether you like it or not. You have to take it into all into account if you're still out there on the road. Well, it sounds like you guys are busy and yeah. doing your thing. Sounds great. You have a great Very staff. Very busy. Thank you. We do have a good staff. Yeah. I wouldn't. Why don't you call them all out by their names and tell everybody what they all do? So we, all... Uh, we have, let me see, our kitchen staff, Angela Muse. We have Pat Verazueta, who works in the kitchen also. And she drives also if we need her to, if somebody, if one of our chauffeurs are out. Um, we have three chauffeurs Ed Banta, Lonnie Walker, Jenny Bromeo. Uh, and the office staff is myself. Um, Lynn Muller and Debbie Klein, who's our social worker. Lynn's my right hand, and Debbie's our social worker. Your left hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, she sits to the right. So, yeah, no. They all do a lot, and I really appreciate all of them. Yeah. And they all really uh, engage so they work well hard. With, our, with all the seniors, as do you, Kathy. And, um, and believe me, it is not an easy task no it's not uh, but they you have to be very you patient make sure that they have something fun to do every day and when we come by and they're dancing they are they love their dance class yeah i haven't seen them do chair yoga but or, chair actually, yoga. I, they did chair, chair you should yoga. come down and join the class yeah i Tuesday. saw actually yeah. um dragonfly uh did a class when captain Borgia was yes there. yeah she, she did a little chair yoga with them which was excellent yeah. I did, I did actually they love that, that class we have about 40 seniors that come to that class great yeah i heard a rumor that you guys are planning a, a special event coming up i don't know <laughs> Do if that's true or not uh no no nope. we don't have nope. a date yet no date but we have an idea yeah <laughs> we're trying <laughs> there's an idea from one of your staff members that, that mm. really, really like to get dressed up not in halloween costumes right um that was another thing that, that was shared recently but they do like to get dressed up and they right. might want to have a prom. A senior even though, prom, yeah. Are they going the to high school usually high school? does a senior prom in March or April. They right. the same time. Yeah, so. No, I know, I know. Yeah. But for some reason. It's hard to plan anything big like that during this time of the year right. because of the weather. Okay. So maybe, maybe in the spring or the summer. It's supposed to snow. Well, it didn't snow on Halloween this year. No, so. it's going to stick to the grass. That's a plus. Yeah. No uh, snow. Thursday into Friday. Great. Tomorrow night. It feels like a Tuesday, but today tomorrow is Tomorrow night. Yeah. All right. Yes, it is. So any other questions for Questions? Kathy? Well, Come on down. So Come join us. You thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. You're thanks welcome. to you and your staff for taking such good care of our seniors and um, being very welcoming. Thank you. And next up, we have our receiver of taxes, Holly Perlowitz, with another departmental report. And do we need to put the screen, the lights back down and everything? Or eventually, but not quite yet. Okay. Not quite yet. We're waiting. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the first time that I'm coming to you since our uh, first half of school tax collection occurred in September. So I just am happy to report that everything went very smoothly. Uh, we collected 98.13% of the first half of 2019-2020 school taxes, which equates to about $54.3 million. And that all happens in one month. It's a pretty wild month for us. Um, uh, there are uh, only, I would like to say, because I, I think it's, I, I know it's a record, 187 parcels uh, remain delinquent for the first half, uh, and they've all been notified by mail, and, um, you know, their tardiness, and we follow, we follow, follow them. Uh, 
approximately, again, just to give you perspective, approximately 6,000 taxpayers were sent bills. Uh, the remaining 4,100 were paid by mortgage companies. Uh, so we do have a whole lot of people that get mail, uh, which brings me to uh, let you know that we're, we continue to be happy with the new fulfillment center that we're using, uh, which has saved us money and has uh, done a good job of uh, tracking each and every individual mail piece that's sent out, which is very important. Uh, and we also work with the postmaster, both here in Ossining as well as the one in White Plains. And sometimes what our role is just is just to connect the two. And that results in an ongoing project to review anything that comes back to us in the office. Um, any bill that comes back, it's really important to me that we figure out why it's coming back. Is there something wrong with the address? Why is it not getting to our taxpayers? Um, I've learned a whole lot about mailing addresses. Um, and again, we utilize White Plains is very helpful uh, coordinating that with us. And um, sometimes, sometimes, we have had a resort to the old fashioned. Uh, we get a mail piece back that just says, can't deliver, no receptacle. And we've had to go to the property and slide under the door <laughs> because, you know, that's sometimes what you have to do. Um, and um, over 1,100 people are using our online system, over 1,100 parcels have been paid with our online system, and just every collection that increases. Uh, so we're delighted about that. Um, if, I, if I have to share one bit of frustration, I'm going to with you, um, and I, I share it I share it just because I think you should know about it in case any of our taxpayers communicate it to, to you. And it really has nothing to do with us. It's frustration because I can't do anything about it. And that's the STAR program. Um, the state is working to get everyone into what, what they're calling a re get the credit, a rebate program, versus people who are now getting the deduction off their bill. So they started this program, they started to, to move everybody towards that in 2015. So all new homeowners have to pay all their taxes up front and then wait for a rebate check from the state. Um, this year they, they said everyone whose income is over $250,000, but less, a, less than a half a million dollars, which is the benchmark for when you're no longer eligible for STAR, you also have to get a, a check. So that makes people have to pay their taxes up front. And we had a whole bunch of people, even though the state said that they notified people, a whole bunch of people contact us and say, wait, what happened here? My taxes went up. And in fact, their taxes didn't go up. It's just that we were no longer allowed to do that deduction off the bill, and they have to wait for the, the check. And then, in addition to that, they, the media informed people that they wouldn't be allowed to take advantage of any increases in the STAR program. And uh, in fact, there wasn't an increase this year. So many people were, were frightened by that, and they opted to say, OK, I'll pay my taxes up front, and I'll wait for this check. The problem is, is that the checks weren't coming fast enough. The state had said that they were going to deliver them before people had to pay their taxes, but that didn't happen. So the frustration for me is all I could do was give them a phone number at the state to call. And uh, I could assure them that they weren't, that, that it had nothing to do with the school taxes going up. It had everything to do with the fact that they were no longer getting this rebate, this uh, deduction off their bill. So I just share that in case you hear of, hear of that from any of your, um, you know, any of our constituents. So now we can go to the, we can go to that. I thought a visual is always helpful when there's a lot of numbers. Again, I I like to to give you perspective on um, on, on taxes in general. So we actually in my in my. Uh, uh, I know that's the wrong deal here. <laughs> I 
No, I do taxes. Be helpful with taxes. Yes, that might help pay the taxes. <laughs> there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so in my office, we we get two warrants per year. Uh, one is for the town and county taxes, which, as you can see up there, is thirty-two million two fifteen five ninety-seven, and uh, also school taxes. We collect the school taxes for Briarcliff and Ossining and the library, and it's collected in two halves. So the total of the school and library taxes for both both school districts and the library is one hundred and ten million eight oh eight. So. Yeah, correct, correct, just the Austin Library. If you pay Austin school taxes, you pay an Austin Library tax. So the total of the warrants, the two warrants, is $143 million. So that's that first column. The second column is what you, the town board, are used to getting from me on a monthly basis, just to tell you what our outstanding taxes are. Um, and currently our outstanding taxes, our tax receivable portfolio, if you would, is 55 million. And the, the lion's share of that is just the second half of the school taxes, which really isn't due until January of 2020. And then the third column, again, just for perspective, gives you all the collections that we've made thus far in 2019. So thus far, we've collected at the bottom, the total is $126 million. And Part of what, what's included in that is not only the town and county taxes, which is collected all within the year, but it's the second half of the 2018-19 school taxes and the first half of the 2019-20 taxes, as well as we continue to, to collect on our delinquent taxes as well. So I just thought, again, for perspective, to give you a, a column that shows the number of parcels related to each of the perceivables, and also to show you what I think are very good numbers, and I'm very pleased with them, and that's the percent of the warrants that, that we've collected. So you can see in the town and county, we've collected 98.94%, and in the school, which was just in September, we've collected 98.13%. Right. And, uh, and we've also collected some of the second half because there are those people that pay both halves. And um, just again to, and obviously we've also collected the second half of 2018-19. Um, of, of and I don't really know what's going to happen in December. Um, it used to be that we had a big December because a lot of people wanted to pay their second half of school taxes in December to take that deduction in their uh, in their personal income taxes, but that changed last year. So it was certainly slowed down the number of people who were paying in December, and um, I suspect it'll do similarly this year. A lot of people still do it, uh, but I don't, I don't know how that will work. So that just gives you, I just wanted to give you a perspective. Um, but while we're, while we're on it, I want to just focus on that delinquent tax lien line where we currently have um, a million, one million one ninety five four twenty three outstanding. I, I just wanted to, meant to, to explain, and I'm sure you all know this, but uh, for others, that New York State real property tax is really very specific on how we have to handle delinquent taxes. Every July, we're required to report all of the taxes that haven't been paid for the previous year. So for example, in July of 2019, anyone who didn't pay the taxes, their taxes in 2018 got reported to the county, and we, in effect, put a, a lien on their property for those taxes. Um, Again, the law is very specific that if those taxes remain outstanding for 24, 21 months, then we go through the process of formally um, foreclosing on the property and auctioning, and it happens almost simultaneously. Uh, we here have been fortunate for us, and I think for our taxpayers as well, that in the last two years we've not had any of those such properties to do that. Um, we every year have what I would sort of call eligible properties that might end up going into foreclosure and auction. And we go through a process where we 
send out what's commonly called like certification of necessary parties and defendants in a foreclosure action. And what that means is you notify people, other people have a lien against the property, you notify sometimes next of kin, whoever the search shows we have to notify. And then there's a lot of communication with this, these property owners, and we've been very lucky that, um, I shouldn't say lucky, I mean, we, we've worked with them and they've paid their taxes, and of course we always hope that uh, this group of property owners that are in this later stages, you know, 21 months down the road, that um, the situation improves and they can pay their taxes, um, and if they can't, uh, we really encourage them to get counseling on how they handle this for themselves um, because if it is going to be a permanent situation, they should get guidance on how to handle their delinquency status. So, and I know you all agree with me, auctions are not something that we want to do. Um, they're not something that uh, you know, we're in the business of doing, but again, the law dictates how we go forward in that. So I just wanted to, um, to address all of you, and uh, any questions? I really think, no. thank you. That was really thank well, you. Okay. Well, thank you so for it's all the probably, uh, yeah. probably the last time I'm going to talk to you before 2019 question. ends. Mm -hmm. So I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a happy and healthy holiday as this, this uh, Holiday season approaches very quickly. Thanksgiving's very soon. Very soon. So I thought you were going to say and remind you us all to pay our second half school taxes. <laughs> I do that. I do see that. You again until after that. But. No, I do that via the email blast, and I do have to say that um, those work beautifully, and I get lots and lots and lots of thank yous, especially the second half of school taxes, because at least in September you get a bill and you have a piece of paper in front of you. Um, but so what's the easiest January. way if somebody's watching this right now and their name isn't on that reminder email and they want to get the email from you, can they email you directly? Absolutely. They can email me directly at hperlowitz, P-E-R-L-O-W-I-T-Z, at townofostening.com. Uh, we have a form in our office um, for people to, to fill in, or they, they can call at 914-762-8790, uh, and we put you on right away. It's That's really a wonderful uh, way of communicating. Can you say, I think you've increased the, that list of quite a lot. I have. I, 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 I have. Uh, the list is over 2,400 now, and I wish it was, I wish it was 6,000 for all the people who get the bill, uh, just because, it, again, forget and you know I'm a taxpayer myself so I know it's easy to forget uh, this that second half of school taxes it's a, a common um, explanation for me to talk to new tax new taxpayers that move into our community and want to understand how to, how this all works I say depending upon where they live if they're in the village I say think three bills five payments because two two on the school and two on the village if you're in the town outside, think two bills, three payments. So anyway, thank you All again. Right. And we have two villages still. I mean, they both have their own set of That's tax true. collections. That's, that, that is true. I am sorry. I apologize. But you're absolutely correct. <laughs> Take care. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much. And next up, we have Sophia Rodwell from DB Resource Group to present to the town board their findings from our townwide tree inventory with two grants from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Urban and Community Forestry Program. We are finally finished with our phased townwide tree inventory of all town parks, cemeteries, and rights of way along roadways in the unincorporated town. We started this process initially with just Angle Park and the roads included in the Millwood Austin Go Plan and completed a full townwide inventory this past year. After Sophia's presentation on the benefits of our public trees and how we can maintain them, 
our local tree expert, Donna Sharrett, will be giving a presentation on how all residents can take similar steps to protect their trees um, on their own properties. So, Sophia, thanks so much for coming, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for having me. Um, so we did the uh, tree inventory for the town of Austining. Um, nope. There we go. <laughs> the tree inventory occurred um, between June and July, not of 2018, but of 2019. <laughs> um, the, we included trees, planting sites, and stumps. Uh, these were located within selected town maintained street right of ways Dale Cemetery, Sparta Cemetery, Buck Johnson Park. Cedar Lane Park, Gerlock Park, and Ryder Park. And the data fields we focused on were their locations. So that was um, the X and Y coordinates and the address, as well as the species, the size, which we do with diameter, um, their condition, primary maintenance needs, uh, and ANSI standard risk assessment and risk rating. Uh, whether or not further inspection was needed, defects, number of stems, and the presence of utilities. Uh, what we found was uh, out of the top five genera, maple made up 28% of Austining's entire tree population. Um, we found just over 3,000 trees, 123 species representing 52 genera, which is a good mix of trees. <laughs> Um, when we looked at the tree condition for Austin's trees, 30% of the total population actually fell into the good category, um, good or better, uh, and that is quite a lot. So kudos to you. 18% um, um, only, only 18% fell into the poor to dead. Um, so that's great. And fair made up the majority of their trees conditions. Uh, when we looked at the diameter class distribution, um, you follow the general rule of more young trees and less mature trees. Um, there is a little dip there around the maturing, so tree planting around that time might have slowed down briefly, but uh, otherwise uh, it's a very good distribution. We use Davy Tree Keeper software. Um, it's a program that allows us to map all the trees uh, with GIS coordinates. Um, it's great uh, and it's available to the public uh, at least for a year um, and anybody can go on and view a tree in front of their house. Um, so summary of your inventory uh, and next steps. We recommend that di you diversify the distributions of genus and species when planting. So 28% of maples um, is higher than our recommended 10% of a single genus in a city or town. Um, we recommend prioritizing and managing established and mature tree populations. Uh, prune young trees now to improve structure, uh, which will encourage better form as they age, and theoretically this will be a cost saver down the line. Um, we recommend using our tree keeper software um, to keep your inventory up to date as work is performed. Um, we will have a meeting, a closeout meeting at the end of finishing your management plan, um, and we'll show you really great ways that um, the community can be proactive in helping maintain the trees. Um, we recommend considering performing an annual ANSI, ANSI level one inventory to identify new maintenance priorities that pop up uh, in the coming years. And we hope that you consider performing a complete re-inventory in five years or one fifth of the population every year. So. Are there any questions? You guys have a question? You want to ask? What happened to Sally School Park? Huh? But oh, let's Sally's talk about school. that. Okay, Sally's, was Sally School Park not on there? No. Did we do that last time? No. We just missed it. Okay. Anyway. All right. Um, so if maples are our top, hey. Anyway, if maples are our top, um, what if we were to plant more trees, what would be your 
recommended blend that we are lacking or have the least of that yep. you would suggest? Yep. So in our management plan, we're actually going to include a recommended planting list based on your hardiness zone, um, which I believe we're in 6A right now. Uh, and that list will essentially remove all maples from it. So you will have a better distribution moving forward. Um, that'll just be uh, generally a lot of native species. Um, and as climate change heats up the northeast, we do recommend planting a couple southern trees. Um, because they are doing really well um, in ur urban environments now. So, What are your recommendations for ash trees that are being killed off by the borer? Are you recommending we plant them, hold off on that? Hold off. Yeah, we've removed ash trees from all of our planting lists for all clients across the U.S. Um, we actually uh, had the, I would say, pleasure because uh, it's, it's something that we're interested in, but we actually found live EAB in Ossining, um, and I actually caught one in my hands, which is very hard to do and very rare um, since they normally wipe out an area a lot faster, but they're they're in your town now. Um, <laughs> EAB being emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer, those that don't know, yes, it's a, I'm sorry. It's a beautiful invasive. insect, um, but it's devastating. Um, what did so. you do with it once caught? I froze it. <laughs> yeah. It's it's uh, mounted in an uh, insect collection right now. Um, but uh, yes, it's, um, we don't recommend planting ash trees. Did you find a lot of ash trees? I mean, I know they kill them pretty quickly and they fall. So did you find any in our parks and or things that we need to be aware of that we're going to have to take care of soon? Yes, um, we did find active infestations of the AB and uh, your management plan includes uh, recommendations on how to handle them. Um, Anything that was of uh, needing immediate attention, we brought it to your attention early on. Um, anything that we haven't brought to your attention until the management plan is is safe to wait um, until you have the funding to take care of it. Okay, and that's it. Yeah, part of that. we already addressed anything okay. that was of immediate concern. And we thank you for that. And you've been helpful in other ways as well. So we thank you for that as well. Um, we also, um, one of the things, I, I think you guys were aware of this, but I'm not sure, we, we applied through DEC for the trees for chips um, and, and received a buffer in a bag and planted those. And one of the things that kind of came up as we did that was that, well, besides it was somewhat of an education for our, our park staff, that there's an incredible amount of maintenance for when you plant these uh, bare root trees, which is how they came. And as we're moving forward, establishing a tree bank and um, wanting to evaluate where we, you know, based on your management plan, um, you know, how we introduce trees back into the community without negatively impacting other structures, mm -hmm. um, so you know, positively impacting the environment without having any kind of negative offsets. One of the things I think that is um, of interest is how are we going to manage, from a staff perspective, um, introducing trees. And I know that I had spoken with, I think it was some somebody from Davy who had talked about some programs in Ithaca where there were a lot of volunteers that got involved in Andy helping Hellman. with the management. Hmm? That would have been Andy Hellman. He used to be the forester for Ithaca. Okay, yeah. So Andy had talked a little bit about that. And so I know that there we had gotten money for the tree inventory program through the, which is the grant forestry. stream? DEC, Urban and Community right. Forestry. Urban Community Forestry. And we're just wondering if, if there's either suggestions for these maintenance programs that we might be able to get some help from for somebody to help us manage volunteers or whoever can do some caretaking of new growth, you know, new plantings or whatever. And if you have any suggestions, I don't know if that's part of your management plan or not. Um, it's not part of this management plan currently. However, uh, we do recommend uh, structuring any involuntary um, organizations uh, kind of off of how New York City does theirs. Um, so they have a lot of groups who go out and, and manage the trees uh, and volunteer to manage the trees. Um, and there's, there's good resources to mimic that. 
Okay. Mike, do you have any questions? Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So thank you very much, yep. uh, Sophia. That was great. And I think, I guess next up, our follow up, Donna Sharon, Master Gardener, Cornell Cooperative Extension yes. Master Gardener, and many hats. Big help. Many hats. Exactly. <laughs> so he's helped start our community garden, organic yes. community garden at Cedar Lane Park. And Gives one of our go-to girls for all information. And, and, yes. So the one real great thing about doing the bare root is um, you're mm -hmm. really, uh, the way that that's being grown is is, um, is it's not being, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're not doing like clone propagation, which, um, so you're going to get genetic diversity, which is really great. Um, because Have you checked them out? I did check them out. <laughs> they need a little extra staking, but they're doing really well. They are. Yes, really well. Yes, I've been giving them personal TLC. Just so when you get stuff from the nursery, quite often I, I listen to a, a seminar, um, so this is even part of my talk, but they said, uh, which is it's an Asian tree, but the paper bark maple, um, they've actually determined that it's from one tree in Asia. Every single paper bark maple that you find throughout our country really? is an exact clone from one. That is not a good thing. <laughs> With the ginkgo, yeah. Oh, really? So, so when you're doing your bare root, you're you're doing like nature does, you know. So you're getting a, a little diversity, and that's um, that's kind of a great thing. So, and they're doing really well. And it's a lot of maintenance, but then they're going to actually do better in the long run because they've had their full root system and the whole thing. So, so, in case. Um, so thank you for having me here. Uh, also, for anyone who doesn't know, I just wanted to thank the town board for. Um, they've adopted many <clears throat> amendments to our town uh, codes to uh, further protect our trees and um, also taken on all these great projects. So the other great news is that Austin is a great place for plants. Um, the ongoing weathering of rich glacial deposits, um, decay of organic matter, the humidity, the, the great um, precipitation are a recipe for a lush landscape. The New York Floral Atlas lists over a thousand native plant species in Westchester County. These plants support an abundance of wildlife to include pollinators and birds, um, but unfortunately um, these populations are threatened by climate change, development, and neglect, and they need our help. Um, so why do we need trees, which would be the largest members of our plant inventory, and mostly everyone knows this, they uh, create oxygen and sequester carbon, stabilize soil, protect water quality, have a cooling effect um, by providing shade during the, the hot season and then um, trans, uh, do this evapotranspiration at night, which keeps the night temperatures cooler, which is actually night temperatures are more impacted by climate crisis than the day temperatures. So it's very important to try to preserve um, a cooler night. Uh, and they also help mitigate um, flooding. Uh, so this quote, a, a healthy 100 foot tall tree can take 11,000 gallons of water from the soil and release it into the air again as oxygen and water vapor in a single growing season, which is kind of amazing. Um, that quote is from this um, uh, publication from the U.S. Uh, Forest Service, um, and I believe this um, will be uh, available to people later so you can get the link. Um, so these are two trees that are um, good for our area, uh, American Basswood and Shadblow um, or Serviceberry, which we planted a Serviceberry, right, mm -hmm. in, our, in the park. So we, yeah. have a, we have a new one, which is great. That's the, what we're talking about, the palm tree? No, the, no. Uh, near that, right near that. The one that you planted near the Oh, got it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I remember. <laughs> So the threats are uh, climate change, deer overabundance, um, invasive species, improper maintenance and neglect, light pollution, uh, and loss of tree species, which um, is very pertinent to um, what was just discussed because in the, in the planning department, um, when, when people uh, propose developments, there, a lot of trees are being taken down and they're replacing them, but they're taking oaks and hickories and um, a lot of different varieties of trees and then they're replacing them with either evergreens or red maples. Red maples seem to be the preferred um, planting for almost every developer. So um, that is something that should be 
um, considered that. And what, what you're doing is you're losing ecoservices from the specific species that are not being replaced. So of course, we're responsible for all of the above. And um, just before I forget, I saw Armstrong Plumbing was on the agenda tonight. So I just have to say, they, I think we're one of the only, if uh, maybe the only developer that actually proposed to plant an oak. So kudos. <laughs> Um, how to make trees healthy and safe, you, uh, you keep trees properly watered and maintained, uh, have your trees routinely inspected for decay, structural defects, and soil lifting. Um, the soil lifting is uh, really critical if we have a lot of rain, which we've had a lot of rain, and then you get a heavy windstorm and it's a, a large tree up in the higher wind. Um, uh, gusts, uh, and perhaps that you'll, you'll notice a tree that's shifted a little bit on your property or the soil is shifted on the uh, one side of the tree. That means you should get someone in right away to make sure that tree is safe because maybe the anchoring of the roots has um, shifted. So uh, plant hardy trees, plant the right plant, right place. Um, so planting a tree that's going to be 60 feet underneath the power line is not a good idea, even though it's cute when it's six feet. Uh, <laughs> Reduce deer pressure, turn off outside lights at night whenever possible. And if you need um, a tree, if a tree needs to be removed uh, by town code, you have to get a tree removal um, permit. Uh, and you get that at the town of Ossining building department. So um, again, thanks to the town board, we now have a tree warden. So when you get your permit, the tree warden comes out to inspect. Uh, it's Craig Stevens. Uh, he's, um, uh, thank you for appointing him. He's really knowledgeable, very nice. And the taxpayer, it's a great benefit because you get a totally unbiased um, assessment of the health and safety of the tree, which I think is a real asset. So um, a few important things, uh, plants, particularly new plants, um, need one inch of water per week. This is a document from Cornell um, called Death of Newly Planted Trees. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a problem because people uh, don't realize that you have to do this very diligently. Uh, take Monitor your trees, particularly for the first three years. Uh, this uh, document is available at our building department, um, and it's also, also through Cornell. So the best way to know if you have enough water is to get a rain gauge. Um, that's a really easy thing to do. Uh, Rainwater is the preferable, but if you don't um, get an inch of water, then you need to irrigate. Um, and you don't want to depend on New York City weather um, uh, report or uh, White Plains weather report, you want to know what's happening in your yard because it could be different. So these are, um, this is what was discussed is there's a lot of problems with the insects and um, I actually had my ash trees treated because I have a big development one behind my house. I did not want to lose my trees. So I, and I'll have to do that every two years for the rest of my life or it's their lives, whichever comes first. <laughs> So uh, a big problem in how the uh, insects move is uh, people bring, they go visit family or go on vacation and then they fill up their trunk with firewood, bring it back to their home, um, stack the wood up and um, insects uh, that had laid their eggs, little eggs emerge and then we have um, the infestation here. So don't move firewood. The spotted lanternfly is a really bad, um, they, uh, Pennsylvania's calling the nightmare insect. Uh, Philadelphia is so bad that they actually have started the lantern fly stomp and people are posting YouTubes of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a new activity, a new what exercise. What? What is that target? I think it's just for use on Sunday. Um, it's yeah. similar to the, I believe similar to the stink bug in that it's um, fruit trees, uh, but I think it, um, I'm not exactly sure if it's, uh, but I know it's an agricultural worry, I believe, it, right? It, it, Right. I don't know if anybody can hear you, so yeah. you have to have <laughs> sorry. sorry. No, no, please. Um, so the spotted lanternfly performs half of its life cycle on Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive species, um, Alanthus altissima, and then uh, the second half of its life is kind of feeding on fruit trees. So apple trees in New York, big export, um, and it's a real problem for the state. And stink bugs also apples. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it's, uh, and that's only been here since 2008. The stink bug. So it's um it's a real problem. Um, and then um, oak wilt, so there's many, many of these things, unfortunately, but I'm just hitting on three. And the oak wilt, if you, um, you can help um, prevent 
uh, your oaks from dying if you only prune October through February when the insect that transmits the disease is not active. So um, again, New York, uh, New York State DEC has a great page on the invasive insects and uh, any questions you can go to Cornell. So invasive vines kill trees. I don't know why anyone would want to look at this when they could see a beautiful tree and shrubs, but um, it's very easy to uh, prevent this by cutting down the vines at the base um, and then um, cutting them 12 inches up from that and then doing it every, you know, for, for two years and then they shouldn't even come back. But of course you want to make sure you're not um, attacking poison ivy without knowing that and without being geared up. So um, this is the poison ivy that looks like it's hairy. It's actually roots. And then this is the, um, the bitter root, um, which is away from the tree. The poison ivy is native and it has a great eco service. But if you're allergic to it, like I am, um, you probably don't want it in your garden space. So, and don't ever burn poison ivy or logs that have poison ivy on it. What does that mean? Eco it has a high eco service. It um, has the berries exactly when the, when the birds are migrating through our area. So the berries are very highly nutritious. So it's, a, it's really serving a great purpose. So poison ivy that we all. Right. And it's also a, like a beacon red, you know, so it's right. like this. It's, it's a, it's, it's really pretty. Yeah. So it's great for the migrating birds. So it'd be really good in the forest spaces. Um, so. So when you, um, for new trees and older trees, um, you should not have the grass right up to the tree. Um, and you can put a little mulch around that grassless area, but you want to make sure that the root flare is showing um, way too often in this area. Um, and I'm not really sure when it started. People started doing what we call volcano mulching, where they bring the mulch way up on the, um, the trunk of the tree. That is absolutely no good for the tree. I don't know who started that, but don't do it. Um, Pulling the grass away from the tree also would prevent this, which is weed whacker damage. Um, and that's not a good thing. And just as a review, all the life actions of the uh, supporting actions of the tree is in this outer ring, which is the sapwood. Um, so that's why it's so critical not to damage the, um, the outside diameter of the tree. Uh, and if there's um, this urban forest today is uh, forestry today is uh, UMass. Um, website uh, and then it has uh, videos and um, actually noontime seminars and all kinds of stuff so that's a good thing. So this is tree abuse. Uh, you shouldn't be pruning trees like they're hedges or not hedges. Um, this one I think they were they're they're just going for to keep it out of the wires which is a noble gesture but they shouldn't have planted a white pine that would be you know that's supposed to be like 80 feet. Um, they should have planted something that would have stayed, stayed smaller. So why plant native? Uh, native plants uh, provide habitat and food for native insects, birds, and mammals. Um, and sticking with the trees, one native oak tree um, can support up to or around 500 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. More than 90% of moth and butterfly caterpillars eat only one plant or group of plants, which most people are familiar with um, uh, monarch butterflies and their dependent relationship on milkweed. There's a few different types of milkweed in our, in our area. 90% um, of moth and butterfly caterpillars require the same kind of thing. And um, that is why we need such a diverse planting and, um, and not just, just maples. <laughs> uh, caterpillars are a critical food source for over 96% of the songbirds. Uh, one Carolina chickadee needs more than 5,000 caterpillars to raise one brood of young. So this is my oak tree. Um, and this is in at my house. This is um, a butterfly that would lay eggs on the leaves of the oak tree. And then, of course, there's, you know, more than 400 other butterflies and moths laying eggs on the oak tree. So, but my oak tree has a lot of leaves. And the reason for that is, is this cute little guy over here and all his friends um, are eating and feeding their babies lots and lots of caterpillars. So the tree is still able to keep enough leaves to function, and it's a, it's a great thing. So um, some great websites. The eBird is a Cornell citizen uh, science project for uh, good for kids and adults. The National Wildlife Foundation um, uh, partnered with Doug Ptolemy, and this is his photograph over here, uh, used with permission. Uh, and he, uh, you can go to this website 
and put in our zip code and it will tell you the insects that we should find here in our area and what plants they need to survive. It's a great, great database. Uh, and then the New York Floral Atlas, which I mentioned before, uh, lists by county um, the plants that are um, found here, native and non-native. So here's three uh, trees and small trees and shrubs that you could use um, by the roadside because they tolerate salt, um, you know, and not in an abundant amount of salt, but they will tolerate some road salt. Uh, and then um, they would be uh, ideal for planting underneath utility lines. So it's uh, beech plum, um, the clethora, and the uh, Himalayas virginiana, which is the native witch hazel, and that is blooming right now. So it's kind of great to have something blooming right now. Even in the snow, it'll be blooming. <laughs> um, so with that, if you had any questions, um, next growing season, you see your plant is doing something that it shouldn't, and you have questions about that, you're, you should contact Westchester uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, they are your contact to the New York State Land Grant University. Um, and you can get soil testing and um, lab diagnostics and just good information. So, um, can I give a, um, a plug for mulching in place at this moment in time? Yeah. Oh, God. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the leaves are falling. And yeah. So, um, that, that last windstorm, um, all those leaves came down on that, that beautiful oak tree all at once. And um, we have a mulching mower. And it took a couple spins through, but um, we got it all all mulched down. Um, and it's um, you know it's just better than putting it out on the on the street. Uh, it's um, all the the leaves that fall that aren't in the lawn. We leave them in the beds because they actually provide habitat for the um, little species um, that are out there, uh, spiders and stuff. And um, it's, uh, it's nature's way of fertilizing. So um, it's, and then it costs a lot of money to ship these things off. If you put them out in the street, um, I don't know if we've ever determined how much the town pays for that, but it gets sent somewhere and somebody makes compost with it instead of us making compost with it. And then they send it back and then we buy it. So it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so all, all the oak tree leaves that fell, you were able to mulch into your lawn, the ones that landed on the lawn? Yeah, it took, it, we, had, we had to go over twice. Mother. When I say we, it was Ken. Well, I went over it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I needed some for some specific garden areas, because um, I've been doing a lot of that. And um, so at one point, um, he did put a bag on to, to catch at the end when it was ground up. And then I put it in, and I also put it in my compost bins. So, because um, the oak leaves take like three years to break down and a maple leaf takes like a year so it's um, if you're just leaving the oak leaves like they are in the garden they will mat so um, yeah yeah so. I got about seven of those I know you do you are <laughs> lucky <laughs> so so in Korea there's a, 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 a craze right now for um, for acorn flour they're making noodles out of it and all kinds of stuff so you would be really a wealthy person over in Korea. So, um, so, but it's um, it, through all all throughout ages, everyone used acorns as a food source, and it's just us in recent recent times that want to get almonds from California, you know, and all these things from far away. But throw our stuff away. Are you away. saying we can eat acorns? Acorns are edible to humans. Yes, you have to wash out the tannins. But better, all throughout throughout civilization, people yeah. even settled based on the presence of oaks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. William Bryant have you, Logan. Have you eaten Do you know acorns? William Bryant Logan? I know you're with the library and all. He wrote a book called Oak. It's easy to remember, and he talks all about that. Huh. I guess we're going to have to read up on our acorns. Yeah, you have to. Uh, you have to wash out the tannins. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a bit of a process. <laughs> it's a big process. <laughs> I've read up on it. It's not a short. Because you have a lot of acorns, so you could really make a lot of money. Beyond a lot of acorns. My, beyond my, acorns. Beyond the yard is just marbles, and then I ran it over with the lawnmower to mulch, so now I have just. Yeah, I have to wear safety goggles because they just go flying as soon as you mow. So, I'm telling it's you, fun. there, there might be a connection because I'm sure that there's people here in this country that that want those products that are made with. I don't know. It's they're highly and sought consider. after. Something to consider. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Like to talk that to me was... about coming to get them. <laughs> 
Is it just put it up on, uh, I don't know. Buy yeah, we're good. Yeah, yeah buy right? nothing. Exactly. Put it on buy nothing. Right. Acorns. It's really as cold. It, it is freezing. Just, yeah, like, what happened? Why did the air conditioning just kick out? I'm happy. That's absolutely bizarre. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yes, Victoria. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. No. Not from. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I guess so. Um, sure. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much, Donna. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Sophia and Davy Resource Group. I think you have, are you here with a couple of your colleagues? Okay, Leanna. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Leanna. And, um, we appreciate all the work that you did here in Austin. And we really look forward to using your map and to getting, I guess, a final management plan and talking about that. Um, I was just recently at a presentation by T-Town um, talking about climate change and how it is impacting our world and our communities and what we can do about it. And I think that uh, we learned that at the local level, a lot of the things that we're actually engaging in here in Austin are exactly what we need to be doing um, from looking at our tree inventory and making sure that we protect what we can and looking at um, our shorelines and which we're doing with uh, our Cornell, um, our climate adaptive design project with Cornell. And um, between that and adding um, the ability for solar to be introduced for community solar projects and making sure that we have um, uh, encouraging, we're encouraging electric vehicles and all these things that sound to, pe to people like, you know, oh, we're just kind of, tree huggers here. We're not tree huggers. I mean, we might be tree huggers, but that's a good thing because otherwise we're not going to be here in a few years. So well, not many years, but if we don't take steps now, it's already too late. So we want to make sure that we get a jump on this and we have to take a lot of steps at the local level to protect our community. And these are among them. So we are doing whatever we can and taking advantage of every incentive that is out there and New York State is putting out a lot of incentives for communities to take advantage of so that we can really start uh, making sure that we have plans in place to protect our community in the near term and the long term. So that's what we're doing here. And I know that uh, the town board has been very supportive of these efforts and we appreciate all the experts that we've been able to bring in to take a look and help us do that. And so thank you all for what you did um, just to move us forward in that direction, and we hope that we can continue to do so. With that, um, I think that we're going to just move things around a little bit, and we're going to talk up about um, some easements. There's two properties in the town where we need public access to service utilities, um, which require easements, and our um, town council, Christy Donna, if you could lead us through this discussion, and we have our uh, town engineer, Dan Sierce, here as well. Come on and join us. Yeah, so I'm going to go over it, and then if you have any follow-up questions for Dan. So there were two easements that um, have been presented to the town. Both of these are for existing pipes, so it's pretty much just house cleaning and tying up some loose ends. Um, the first that was mentioned was um, the Armstrong easement, which is located 593 North State Road. And so basically this is a water line that has been there for a long time. Its purpose was to prevent there from being dead ends in the water mains, which was what it would have existed, but for this line connecting them. Um, and so uh, as far as the, we can understand it, the lines were put there, were put there a while ago. Um, the property owner just happened to come in for planning board approval, um, but it didn't show up on the survey because there was no easement or record of it. And so um, when they started building, uh, the water main came to light. And so the town asked for an easement in order to um, ensure that they were, that if the town needs it, they can gain access to the property for maintenance and, and the such. And so the property owner's done that and it's been offered to the town. And so unless the board has any concerns or objections, you could put it on for your agenda on Tuesday to authorize the supervisor to sign and then it'll be recorded with the county and that'll be it. Sounds good. 
What's the downside? There, there is none. Okay. It, <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, he needed this and we were accommodating his needs. He's accommodating us to fix a, a problem we had. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. That sounds good. And the next one? And then the other one is part of the Thornton Hill subdivision. It's, I believe, 16. It was lot 16 um, in that subdivision. And when the sewer line was put in, it wasn't put in exactly the location where it was shown on the plat for the easement to be. And so when the developer recently came back to finish the development, we asked that he obtain an easement in the correct descriptive location from the current property owner, which he did. And so it's just another good thing to improve the town's access to make sure that if, if we need to be able to access the properties to do things that that you have the rights in place to do so and it doesn't become an, an unnecessary issue down the line. That little drawing, can you just pass it? Okay. It was a recorded easement, but they missed when they sold the pipe. They, so they didn't hit the area, so right, they, they moved. The, so now they've got an easement in the proper area where that the pipe matches is really the as built. This matches Correct. the as built. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So again, it's, it's sort of housekeeping. Okay. And it, in, the, it includes an, an actual description meets and bounds description um, of where the actual line is yes and that's been reviewed and it's been has it been recorded with the county no because it's we're in the same situation where we're presenting this to the board and unless there's any further objections um, it can also be put on for the it's already been both have al already been signed off on by the property owners um, with respect to the one we're discussing now that's part of Thornton Hill um, all of the recording documents are signed and it's ready to go to the county. Um, we just have to go through the proper procedure. And um, so, again, again, same thing. If the board was so inclined, we could put it on for Tuesday for to authorize the supervisor to sign the easement and any necessary recording documents to facilitate its being recorded with the county. I'm with you. We're also inclined. Okay. Thank you, Dan, Thank for you, stopping Dan. by after your <laughs> planning board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Do. All right, so next up, we have been working closely with our project manager at NYSERDA to complete the bike lane infrastructure along North State Road, um, as was presented to the town board in August by Zeke Mormel from Sam Schwartz Engineers. Part of their recommendation included reducing the speed limit on North State Road from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. So I'm now going to turn it over to Victoria Caffarelli from my office to discuss how we are hoping to move forward on this speed limit change. Yes, so um, yes, the speed limit change was included in uh, Zeke's initial presentation to the town board. This is something that they um, you know, came to us with as a recommendation if we're moving forward with the uh, line striping, which we are. Um, and so at this point, um, Zeke prepared this memo that you have in front of you that we shared with um, our various first responders, the Austin Police Department, the Briarcliff Fire Department, Austining Ambulance Corps, et cetera. Um, and we have not received any response from them, um, but you know, we know that this is going to make the road safer for both the bicyclists as well as the um, car drivers too. Um, I mean, the chief did weigh in that he, he did say that yeah, they, have he, no, they have no issue with it. Right, so, right. Mean, yes, yes. He did respond it will, and yes, in, and the, he, in the positive by saying there was no issue. Right, right, right. right. He was at that meeting with the um, business owners on North State Road. So, uh, I mean, it seems like an insignificant um, change going from 30 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. But um, what Zeke's memo here um, describes is that there really is um, a big difference between the, the, the two speed limits um, in terms of likelihood of a pedestrian or a cyclist dying in a crash, as well as the cone of vision that you have when you're driving in a car, when you decrease the speed that you're driving, um, it really makes a huge difference in how much you can see when you're driving. So, you know, he detailed all this for us. So we're hoping now to 
um, set a public hearing um, next next Tuesday. We will vote on calling for a public hearing, hopefully um, either the last meeting in November or the first meeting in December, depending on um, how quickly we can turn around the text for the local law change um, and move forward with it. We have our um, the uh, contractor for the line striping, I think, is actually getting started this week, which is really exciting. Um, we have yeah. some of the signs. I think our signs have come the, in. The signs have not come in yet. We okay. have, are we are waiting on a second quote on the signs. Okay. Um, but um, our highway department is hard at work getting. <laughs> it's kind of a lot of signs, so it's been it's been a little bit of a process for them. But they are getting quotes for us, so we'll have the signage in place as well. So. Fantastic. So what's exciting about the local law is that your code already has this little chart <laughs> that's reserved that shows what all de specifically designated speed limits will be, but there aren't any yet, so this will be your first. Uh -huh. So all basically we'll have <laughs> so to do exciting. is in insert like the name <laughs> of the street and the speed limit. Oh, so that shouldn't be an issue. How but we still have to have a public hearing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. of course. Yes, yes, yes. 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 It was just, okay. Victoria I mean, was like talking about the drafting of the local okay. law, yeah. which so is just basically going to be amending this, this, <laughs> this provision of the code. I see. To, I will have to get a description and make sure that it's clear, but it, it shouldn't be a heavy lift, is yeah. all I was saying. And if all of this gets approved, how quickly would signs go up and the speed limit change? Um, well, the, the speed limit would change based upon however long the public hearing process would take. Um, but the signage, I, we're, we're hoping to get the whole project, the actual physical infrastructure changed but by the end of the year so that we can stay within the timeline for our grant funding with NYSERDA. So, um, you know, the signs will go up when the speed limit changes. And so hopefully within the next few weeks. Well, what kind of education are limit, we doing? Can't can the speed limit change in the next few weeks? No. Well, the speed limit will, will change once the local law goes into effect, Great. which will be, I mean, from a practical perspective, here. without the signs, people are going to know. So enforcement is going to be yeah, that's my impossible yeah. <laughs> right. um, until you have the signs up because then people right. don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Right. So it's I mean, in terms of getting a local hand. law, we have to. It takes a long, the, the bit well, I guess more than I said, it's more than a few weeks. weeks. I meant like, well, yeah. a month and a half. Okay, so yeah. you call for the public hearing um, on the 12th, right? right? Yeah. It, it, say you open it on the 26th. Uh, you may want to leave it open a couple of meetings depending upon turnout. I don't know. Um, you'll have to play it by ear. And then whenever you close the public hearing and vote, whether that's the first meeting in December or the second meeting in December, I don't know if there will be a second meeting in December. Um, and then it, the local law becomes effective upon filing with the Secretary of State unless another time is designated in the law, but that's as fast as it be can become effective. And so that's that's really your timeline. At least a month and a half. So. Oh, well, yeah. That's what I can. Okay. There's going to be a learning curve. I tried driving 25 from coming back from Club Fit, and it was not a natural feel for me. I it is that. not you know, a I, you know, field. going from I I went thirty and then I went down to twenty five and <laughs> that's going to be a learning curve for me. But yeah. the bottom line is that we know people don't drive the speed limit as much as we'd like them to. Right. However, the whole idea is that enforcement of, you know, that I don't think that they start ticketing you until you're going forty and a thirty at the at you know. Right. 40 and the 30 is 40 and a 30 not a big deal. Like 40 and 25 is, and is you know, now, day the officers. Yeah, yeah 40 think, and a 30 is not great. But again, 40 and a 25, now that's a big deal. So it makes it easier to ticket the somebody going that lower speed limit, which is already too fast, right, than, than it does when you lower the speed limit. I understand limit. the reason. I'm just the saying theory, right. I'm going to have I understand. Limit. When you're going the correct. <laughs> you're yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's <laughs> So, um, great. Yeah. So we'll add a resolution next Tuesday to call for the public hearing. And hearing no, no uh, uh, objections that's all good. to doing so, I assume everybody's on board. No, with absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're going to put bike, more bikers out there. We've got to make it safer. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Uh, which just reminds me, I didn't um, mention this in the announcements, but I did um, go to a meeting today that was um, at the county um, with the uh, um, DOT from New York State as a response to uh, the Village of Briarcliff's um, public outreach campaign uh, and 
communication with the DOT on improving uh, 9A, the 9A corridor. Specifically, their focus was on the bridge, uh, the Pleasant Hill Road bridge and the many um, truck accidents that they have because trucks are supposed to sh need to shift over. If they're taller trucks, they need to shift over into the middle lane or they hit the, the bridge and um, there's, not, there's not really effective um, signage. signage, although the DOT pointed out even where they have very effective signage doesn't necessarily help, but that doesn't mean it doesn't help. It does. It does help. It just doesn't save all solve all the problems. However, uh, the DOT has made a commitment to making a lot of the um, minor fixes to the road that uh, Briarcliff had identified, specifically including. Um, attempts to fix the guardrail more quickly than than has been able to be done um, and some potholes and some concrete that has been on the road for years in a couple of spots with which was confirmed by our highway superintendent um, as well as better signage uh, and markings for the bridge and um, a number of other things and then they're also going to look into the best way to address the broader issue of um, what they had discussed as a corridor st study, but was suggested might be preferred to be an engineering study or a um, or something else, which could then potentially lead into um, some sort of funding stream that would help get uh, a major improvement to the roadway. Um, and you know, funded, uh, and they did say that the biggest uh, obstacle to the improvements to nine A, um, the biggest obstacle is funding. However, um, it's not the only obstacle. The other obstacle is that the right the right of way isn't very big, so any widening or whatever would have great impact on. Uh, the neighboring properties. So in any case, uh, it was a very interesting and well-attended meeting, and uh, we look forward to hearing additional feedback from the state as to how they will address this. And uh, of course, we did discuss that the entire corridor from 9A9 sp um, split to the um, where the Taconic comes into 9A is really the the bigger area of concern. So we're hoping that that's going to be addressed in whatever way the DOT sees uh, with the county going forward. And that is it for this evening. So we look forward to seeing everybody next Tuesday, November 12th, for our regular meeting, which will be at the courthouse. And uh, I'd like to take a motion to go into executive session for advice of counsel and personnel. Move second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks so much. Have a great night, everybody.